Welcome back to another episode of Tesseract LNO Fireside Chat. I am one of your co-hosts, Austin Barkdahl, out at JBMDL in fabulous New Jersey. Uh, today, I've got my other co-host, Nathan Den, and today we're starting a series on pushing innovation uh, from idea to finish line. So this series, we're really hoping to capture kind of you know, the grassroots uh, start to finish of some of the innovations that are out there uh, making their way through the field. So uh, I'll pass it off to Nate for an intro, and then we'll get over and talk to Sergeant Powers. Hey, good morning, everybody. Mass Sergeant Nate Dead over here at PACAF uh, headquarters. Uh, really excited for today's chat. I know Austin and I uh, have been talking with uh, Phil and the other Tesseract team of you know, we've done a few of these chats with different ideas. So now let's look at what's going on in the field and taking some of those ideas and championing those and, and highlighting what's going on so we can, you know, move forward what, what the intent of this whole program is, is to get good ideas implemented and usable for airmen at the ground level. Um, so that's where we're going to start today. And uh, Austin, if you want to introduce the people that we have today and what the product is, we'll We'll quick click it over to them and you know i'll be excited to hit my mute button here for most of this episode and and really hear about what this project is how it started uh where it's going and uh you know that wonderful lesson learned journey along the way hey man yeah all right so yeah i'm gonna kind of turn to the side here a little bit because i got my notes over here but uh master sergeant ryan powers out at uh aldafra currently with phantom works we also have uh another guest matthew sunday um so we'll kind of get the backstory of acclimate um and that's that's this week's um interest so we're hoping to get some insights from from ryan and and hopefully from matthew too from from his perspective on how all this kind of came to be and yeah like nate nate said kind of where we're at where you know where we were where we're at uh, with acclimate where we're going so um yeah i'm excited too to not to not be talking so much on this episode and really trying to like you know just highlight some of the amazing things that uh that are going on out there in the air force so uh without further ado brian i'll i'll pass it off to you and uh give us a, a kind of like a, a background of yourself and uh and the acclimate system awesome so uh master Sergeant ryan powers uh air force for about 18 and a half years now. Um, security forces by trade for about a decade, uh, went to medical, um, ended up as a general's aide, came back to medical, now deployed here at Aldafra. Uh, about 45 days of the first time ever in an innovation cell. Um, and uh, I think what would be appropriate is to get this going in kind of the right direction is Matt, if you're willing to talk for about a minute or two on where you took this to where you met up with me. And kind of let's step this from the beginning, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. We would love to hear how the project literally started in its thought phase to a prototype and how it moved along the whole chain into the hands of, of Tesseract and, and where we're at today and what you guys hope it to be. Roger. Great. Well, uh, I'm am, I'm am going to give you a uh, uh, the, the story we'll say from the beginning. So this was an, uh, originally an airman innovation. So um, uh, who is now Captain O'Brien, uh, for, former enlisted security forces, uh, <clears throat> recognized that uh, he carries around a camelback constantly. He, he keeps it cold. The idea, the, the idea being, uh, is there any way I can leverage uh, the cold fluid that's in there to, 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 to kind of to, to, to help me when I'm out on post? Um, he can tell the story better than I can, but at the end of the day, he he recognized that it's like, well, this is this is this is not rocket science. I can I could take a pump, I could take tubing, I could create a pad, I can I can tie the system together, I can put power and controls in this thing, and uh, when I want to, I can push a button, pump fluid into a pad, and keep myself cold inside, uh, cool or cooled off inside my armor uh, on demand. He took that idea and moved it forward to a prototype. Uh, it started to, it, it clearly worked. Uh, it, it started to gain interest. Uh, he went to spark cell competitions 
and ultimately refined it to the point where the Air Force filed a patent, which officially, uh, which which is officially patented as of less than I think two months ago. So it is a, a Air Force patented technology, um, and uh, he then took that uh, that prototype system uh, forward to the an Army's uh, 18th Airborne Dragon's Lair competition, and uh, was one of the co-winners at, at that event. And that's relevant because uh, at this point now, the program, which we'll get to, is is joint funded, meaning the Army is putting innovation dollars uh, towards this in support of it, which is which is a big deal. It, uh, one 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 thing about Dragon's Lair is the idea that they have all this technology that they say wins, that says that that uh, you know the, the Army's the Air Force needs it, so on and so forth. Uh, but how are we ever going to get any of this tech out there? How many how many of these champions have ever fielded a solution? And that's one of the hurdles that, that they've been struggling. I would say that they've been struggling with, which um, them jumping on board to support us has been huge. Um, the next step after that win, um, uh, one of the uh, civilian engineers, uh, Mike Moulton, uh, exited the Air Force uh, on, under the EOP program. It's an entrepreneurial program where he steps out uh, with, a, with a small, uh, sm small business, which uh, is, is my company. Um, the core, and uh, we partnered together, put together a, a CIBR proposal. If you're not familiar with what a CIBR is, it's small business innovation research. It's uh, federal dollars that help support, in, in this case, a commercial solutions offering uh, where a system exists that needs to be hardened or refined to be appropriate for fielding, whether that's for the Army, whether that's for airmen, whether it's for job specific or whatnot. It is it, this thing had achieved TRL TRL seven, which means that field trials that happened. Uh, Nellis Air Force Base is one of the testing grounds. Uh, uh, Master and Barry was 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 part of that and helped facilitate that. Uh, where you know out on a flight line where it was near almost 130 degrees, it was like 127, 129. You know, uh, airmen were were wearing the system and it took the edge off. It's not air conditioning. It doesn't keep your whole body cool, but what it really does is it just knocks it down. And while you're doing your tasks out in the heat for two, three, four, eight hours, you have the ability to have some level of relief and, and keep keep focused and keep doing your job as opposed to just melting. Um, Mike and I uh, put together uh, the CIBR proposal. Uh, it was select. It was deemed by the Air Force to be selectable, non-funded. And there, the comments in in the response let you know that anybody can fund this, and therefore that became that became uh, what we start tried to do: started championing this effort. The folks that provided letters of support, MOUs, things like that, we let them know it's like, hey, it's selected. Do you have any funding to put towards this? Because because this is not uh, extremely high tech, it could be it could be partially funded and still achieve some kind of value, and that's really where we're at right now. And and literally. Um, I'd say an eight, uh, not an eight month, at least a six plus month effort to gain funding to create a contracting mechanism uh, it is what happened. Uh, and with that, now additional funds have been applied. And one last part of this is uh, uh, my company is located in the state of Kentucky, who has a, a unique silver uh, dollar match program. And this program was uh, selected for by the governor uh, and the cabinet for economic development for the full uh, $150,000 first year match and is now eligible for the second year $150,000 match. So they're willing they're willing to double down on the first $150,000 of federal federal funds to help get this solution out to the warfighter. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. I'll take over. So, yeah. so basically what happened from there, just to get it in our, our the military side was, uh, uh, basic story. So I sit here, I take over this innovation cell. Uh, I have probably zero clue about what I'm doing in innovation, to be honest with you at this time, probably about 45 days to 50 days ago. And a an, uh, security force member comes in and says, hey, look, we want to do some, we need some. The airman here is 100, I mean, we hit it last night, 125, not on the flight line, like three days ago. Um, and the gate here, the main gate had no shade, which we fixed that problem too in innovation, which is a pretty cool win. Um, but so I was like, they pretty much needed something to stay cool. So I started doing the typical, like, don't know innovation, don't know Barry, don't know anyone. I'm literally like, oh, let's you for this up and find something to buy that already exists, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And I'm like, we'll just do it the normal way. And then um, all of a sudden, just how it works, man. Uh, she's in the chat, I think, but Dora Hernandez 
uh, walked in the room and was like, hey, I'd like to volunteer to Spark Cell. I have experience. I work with this guy. His name's Senior Barry. I say senior because he doesn't like that. It's soon to be Senior Barry. Um, he, he can help you with something. There has been a vest that's been created. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, there's been a vest. And we went start doing the research. We call Phil Barry. We're like, hey, what's going on here? And they were like, yeah, they explained exactly what Matt said. Kind of that, you know, it's here. This is where we're at. He's like, I have $40,000 for you, but your contracting office is not going to take it because it's not enough. And I was like, literally, Barry can probably attest this. I was like, oh, don't worry. I got this. Never met my contracting office in a day of my life, man. But I'm going in here and I'm just smoothing. And I'm literally like, look, I have this thing. Will you take on a Sibber? A Sibber. And the guy was like, what's a Sibber? Sergeant Merritt, which I wish he was here. He's like, what's a Sibber? And he kind of knew a little bit. Obviously, he knew AFWorks. They're not, they deal with contracts. He kind of knew. But like, I've talked to you guys a little bit. He got the innovation eyes. I call him the innovation eyes. It's the interest, the what, how can I do this? Can I do this in my own will? So his wheels just started spinning in his head and he was like, what do I need to do? And I was like, well, let me talk to the command. Let me understand this. So I talked to the command, briefed him a lot, a lot, um, numerous times. At one point they had to send a letter to, to Philip because they thought I was stealing money from the United States Air Force. Um, they thought, they couldn't imagine that we were somehow finding money that was out there to fund technology. So we got the money. We put the $40,000 on. In this time, like I started talking to Matt, and I don't know if like me and Matt just kind of connected, but Matt understood. Like I get it. It's a business. He understands I'm sitting in 150 degree heat. Like how can we push this cause together? You know what I mean? And we understood. So we kind of worked out in partnership. And you ask about innovation like that. It, it takes a personality, right? Like first things first, I wouldn't be here if Dora didn't walk through the door and I was crazy enough to go to Philip and say, hey, Philip, let's talk here. What do you what do you need from me? And then he gives me the basics. And then me and Matt, literally, you can ask Matt. I, I called him. It was like, hey, I'm Master Arm Powers. He was like, uh, okay, who are you from where? And, and we just started talking through this stuff. And um, we started talking and uh, I kind of went into like a little bit of dealsmanship here. I was like, you know, we'll play this game, you'll play that game. And there was a little bit of that, nothing bad. And we just drew this bond. Like, it's all about it. Like Tom and we, we've talked like through briefings and stuff. And me and Matt have talked numerous times. We tech long, texted and conversated how we can do this right. And um, pretty much got to the point where we sent out one vest as a show and tell. So I can show it to you right now just to go a little bit. So um, here is Acclimate. Um, so it's pretty much the vest. I'll go sideways. I'll back up a little bit. So Camelback. Normal camera back, two tubes, one goes into a pad, kind of like the heart chamber in one in one side, out the other, back into the camel back. Um, as a great man I know says, it's a 10 pound product in a five pound bag. Uh, we'll change that sooner than later. Uh, that's a work in progress. Um, so we, we just started talking. He sent one out. Um, I finally was able to convince the command to take the contract and everything like that. And now we have the contract and we started this process. And uh, we pretty much, we had one come in and started showing it to people. We can talk about that a little more as you guys have questions. I've put it on like seven career fields. I think it's been like 12 airmen now. Um, we can go through all, if you guys want to, some of their feedback on that. Um, and so we got the one and then the one turned in, if you can see behind me, the one turned into six. So now we have six. Those six of them will be going on to the defenders. So one, I'm able to help them stay cool right now. I get them the coolness, but I also get Matt the R&D he needs to take this across the finish line. Um, and one thing I really enjoy about working with Matt and his team is there's an exit strategy. We joke about it, right? You hear big business. It's like, just keep giving me money, money pit, money pit, money pit. Like me and Matt literally just had a meeting yesterday and we're like, here's our, here's our steps and here's our exit strategy to have a, a viable product by the Air Force in the next, I'm not going to say six months, but sometime soon hopefully before the year's end. You know what I mean? I'm not going to put that on their team. They still got to do some stuff, but um, that's that's the gist of the process. Um, I will say you guys asked kind of like from the ground level what it looks like. Um, like I said, it, it's not easy. Like me and Phil, Phillips had to talk me off the ledge like two or three times legitimately with how frustrating it gets talking to people on base about doing X, Y, and Z and them not understanding what Sibbers are, or understanding what we're doing here or, if we give you money, why are we not getting anything back? You know what I mean? Like those are things that are not common in Air Force lingo these days. So um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much right right now. Um, 
I got these in and we're about to go to town. I hate to say it, this is where it gets real busy because we're about to take these on the gates, test them, collect data, collect everything from that so he can develop some more and uh, keep the process going so we can we can meet a deadline to produce to the force. I mean, like I say, it's real talk. It's 100 and I got a day right now. I looked over on the phone. It was like 10 o'clock at night and it was 109 degrees. And if you've ever, if you've ever been a defender or done gate guard or gate duty or anybody in this heat, that is miserable. And this is literally a very simple idea that can save people from heat stress and just not enjoying what they're doing in the Air Force, you know? So uh, it's taking a lot of passion, a lot of energy, the whole team here. Um, it, it's just trying to figure it out and make it work. And we're keeping going. Like I said, this is where it really starts. So um, I'll leave it open the floor of questions or anything, anybody on the chat or anything you want to do. That's awesome. That's awesome, Ryan. Thank you. I, I'm a crew chief by trade, and I've been downrange several times, so I know the pain and the the struggle that security forces and maintainers and a lot of other career fields face. Like that's no joke. You know, they like you know in Kuwait, you'll have uh, bushes spontaneously combust, right. <laughs> you know, just catch fire. You know, yeah. like it's hot. So um, that that's that's awesome. I, I did. You kind of you kind of hit on something that we talked about. Like, and I want to see if. If you could give us some more detail on when you when you mentioned that when you initially started talking to the command teams, you said I had to keep talking to them and keep talking to them. Can you can you give me and and, and us some 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 more on exactly what that was like um, to really get that point across and to to have everyone kind of find common ground? What was that? What was that process like? So I think one thing that we really had to work on is. Uh, how do I say this? Like, it was it was just repetitive because obviously you catch them in small small bits, small glances, right? And every time it was like bringing a new thought. Like I hate to say it, like and and, and it's not something they're used to, right? So every time, like we brought it up. So really, what we had to do was we just had to explain it to them. Like I put together a slide. Presentation's key, right? That's the one thing that's tiring in the innovation world. That I will say is every conversation you go into, you're a businessman in some form or fashion. Uh, some form or fashion, you're trying to sell something, right? And it's it's either your product, it's either funding, it's either this, right? And um, I really just had to keep going and keep trying. I mean, Philip's on the chat, he's listening back, or he's not going to bring it up, but we literally had, hey, man, I went this way, how do I go this way? You know what I mean? Like, I went this way, how do I go this way? And it, it was just a repetitive thing. And like I said, they even went to him, he was giving them answers, and we still had to go another way. Um, so I would say it's just, how you present, I think that's one thing I learned from this is how do you present and then be diligent and just keep presenting and keep presenting and keep presenting. I mean, literally, I told you guys offline, but I'll, I'll say it online. Like I brought it to a commander and the commander was like, no. And then I told him it was free and he was like, okay, I'll take it. Like, and sometimes and that was, that's like, what it takes, right? Yeah. And it wasn't even like the leadership leadership. It was a unit leadership that we were trying to help. And it was literally like, they. what do I get out of it? And having to explain it's free. Like I said, it's just finding the in and getting your foot in the door. And I, I'm I'm getting better at this. I'm not saying I'm great. Because like I said, I have a lot of help and a lot of teammates, whether it be a captain, Dora, who's on here, has been very helpful in the process. Um, but yeah, just being diligent and coming at it from every angle and just, and just not stopping. I mean, we had meetings. To be honest with you guys, I literally probably had four meetings, five meetings, week after week, and saying the same thing over and over again in just a different avenue and then finally they accepted it so it's not necessarily kind of just like an aha moment that you reach and you're just like and everything falls into place and the stars align it's like first of all it sounds like it was a network right so it was a huge combined team effort with multiple organizations multiple people with the same amount of passion and dedication to innovation that you have um that's that's kind of the big takeaway that I get from that is just to keep going. If you really believe in it and, and, you, and you think that that capability is going to enhance warfighter readiness and make them more comfortable out there doing their job, it's worth it, right? The juice is worth the squeeze oh, yeah. and to keep keep pushing it. Oh, yeah. And even, I mean, I always like, I'm not going to lie, like I put myself, so I'm obviously in an innovation cell, right? And people walk in the door and they give me ideas similar to a commander, similar to anyone in your position at Tesseract, right? If someone comes up and walks into my office and says, I have a great idea, and then disappears for three months, is it really a great idea? Is it really a need? 
Or another good thing is like, I have people come in and say, I have a great idea for another career field. And then you go talk to that career field and you're like, it is a good idea. And they're like, I don't know what he's talking about. Where did that come from? We don't have that problem. So I just put myself as like, when people bring that stuff to me, I can only imagine it a squadron or a wing or a group, like I'm gonna be fair to them. People are bringing stuff to them every, every day. So if you're not passionate about what you're doing to push this, you're not, I won't say you're not gonna get through, that sounds bad, but it's it's gonna be a struggle. Like you have to be able to eat, one, be passionate about it and, and two, advertise it the appropriate way. And again, I wouldn't have done that without Phil, without Matt giving me terms and knowledge and stuff in business. Dora helping me out with, hey, here's like, here's how you explain things to people. Like it's a team effort like you just said. Is your mic, sir? We can't hear you. I'm bad. You're good. Uh, I saw, uh, Nate, I saw you uh, jump off mute for a second. Did you have a question? Because I can, I can jump in again, but. Uh, oh, go ahead. I saw you, uh, your mouth moving and the mic was still on. So I was going to jump in and, and let you know. Uh, like Ryan said, we couldn't hear you for all of them. I'm trying, I'm trying to be a, I'm trying to be a, a nice co-host. We run this, we run this together. Very professional uh, operation over here. No, I but, was just uh, going to jump in and say, uh, you know, Ryan, you're talking to, you know, there's a lot of themes that always stick out through these um, chats that Austin and I do and something that we always talk about. <clears throat> the two main things that we talk about offline about innovation and something I talk to, to Phil a bunch about is the lessons learned process and an innovation systems process. And you kind of talk about both of those things along the way you highlighted, you know, exit strategy, which is gigantic in an innovation system itself, something the Air Force just, it doesn't have. So what is your idea now that you have some of these in the field and what's your, your vision moving forward as far as, you know, you have the handful of items in your hand, what's your testing now going to look like? And what does this thing look like, like you said, in the next six to eight months here in the future? And Matt, if you have something that you wanted to jump in there with as well, that's Go ahead and feel free to do so. So let me let me jump in on that one just a little bit. So um, the the Cibber program is something that uh, I've been involved in for for quite a few years, uh, working with other companies and things like that. And and one critical piece of why we threw our hat in the ring to go after this one was we 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 viewed it from the beginning as something that 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 had a finish line meaning it's something that could be delivered to the warfighter it was not going to be something that uh, gets archived uh at the end of a program great job you developed the innovation um we'll get back with you or take it forward to industry and uh one one key piece uh to to this success route and i'm not going to harp on it too much but i do want to mention it again the state of kentucky putting their dollars in is they're not dollars to do what you've said you're going to do in the cyber they're dollars for you to set up a company to be able to launch the product. Everything a Cibber can't pay for, they can, whether it's equipment, whether it's branding, whether it's advanced development. So you, it's got its own proposal. It's got its own tasks, but they're all intended to help you bridge uh, what in the Cibber world, what's known as the Valley of Death, which everybody's kind of referring to it. All this innovation that doesn't have that extra little push, that extra little support system to actually get it there. And that's one thing, uh, in, even in writing the Cibber proposal and stated in the Cibber proposal, this should be at its finish line in, in, in the embodiment that's being described by the end of this program. This isn't something where you got to go back out and start, start begging for more dollars. There's no reason this can't be there. Now, that being said, uh, one of the pushes uh, that, that is, is ongoing is what's a near-term solution that we can give? So I don't need 100% perfect. What I need is something that is, is not going to break. It is it is ruggedized. It's understood that it's a first acquirable version. And how do how do you make it available so that people can get their hands on it? And uh, and and again, that's what part of those Kentucky dollars are intended to be. And that's uh, that's one output of this uh, phase two effort that's slightly different than what you typically see in a phase two, which is an intent for product even before the program's finished. We won't be that final embodiment. You know that. That, that third generation version of it, maybe that's the end of, of the program, but that first generation program, if it can be acquirable, if it can make an impact now, 
uh, then get it out there as quickly as possible. And we'll have the support dollars already in hand coming in from the state to help make that happen. You know, And what's that delivery timeline? Like you said, six months, eight months. It depends on, on, on how hard we have to push in different directions. Um, and I will say, uh, again, this is, is this, this is very much a grassroots sieve. It is partially funded at this point. The Air Force has put in money. The Army has put in money. The state is matching those dollars. But there are still voids in the task order and the objectives that have to be achieved within that sieve. It's got, it, you know, those can't change. That's, that's fixed. But testing and evaluation, iteration, all that stuff, and, and then compliance and all those other elements, which are and, and designed for manufacturing, those are, those are not just trivial elements. Those are things where, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road uh, to really provide something out there uh, to the warfighter. Over. That's amazing. I had something real quick about that. Like, uh, I'm sure a lot of folks in innovation pushing for something with, that has kind of come come through the grassroots and and not been fully fleshed out and still requires some of that evaluation on the technical side and and, and it requires that funding. Like we've I've I've had personally folks tell me you know key stakeholders are like you've given me a car with no engine or you know how, however they describe it like you've given me 80% of a solution but what the stakeholder really wants is 100% of the finished product that's sustained and ready to go and immediately ready to be implemented as much as i would love to do that what you talk what you just talked about that that kentucky funding and additional kind of like the creative not very like i guess what we would deem as like essentially non-traditional funding vehicles like could you could you speak into in, in detail on how that process worked? Because um, I'm sure that there's folks out there in innovation that might be able to benefit from something like that. That's just even that to me is a is a new is a new process. So, so you're talking about uh, so this match funding, uh, the match funding is it was part of it was that was part of the recipe even before writing the proposal. So they were on board with a letter of support. Which again, you know, the, when when reviewing this, it's like you're literally these are competitive dollars as well, but uh, you're literally coming to the table with the ability to match cyber funding and innovation dollars on day one. Literally, this this program uh, has matching dollars before we've even got six weeks into the program. That is, it's just game changing. And again, it was something we knew about early on. I knew I was going to compete for. Um, the state of Kentucky even worked with us because we still did not have a financial award yet. Uh, we just had, uh, it was it was right at the threshold. They allowed us to apply. They gave us a date. You have to have funding on, in on by this date. We got funding in the day before. Uh, they said, we can match up to the 150K as long as you get 150K on this by the end of June. We had four hours left in the end of June when we got the, the Army funds on contract. Four hours left in the business day. Kentucky matched it in that four hours. It was a it was a it was a two hundred and ten dollar add to the program, with four out with a four hour deadline remaining. That's that's how that's how. So I don't know if I want to call it pushing limits, or or uh, or basically yeah, it's it's like a, it's almost like a high roller game. But we right at the very end every single time we just barely get to that point. And again, it, it it's because we're putting so much pressure on the system. And, and there's enough people that want this. It's not that money didn't exist. It was all the wrong color money until this was finally, until this was finally program, which now offers some latitude for, for uh, O&M money versus R&D money and things like that. But it, again, uh, Ryan's team built the boat. And you know, at, at this point now, uh, we're, we're moving forward and other people are jumping on to go for the ride. I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Ryan. Did you want to say you did you want to did you want to say yeah. something there to that? So, okay. I think one thing about that is, and I will answer the question about like where we're going from this. If you guys still want me to, um, when Matt when Matt tells you like we we were pushing, I was sitting here and I think it was almost what nine o'clock my time, Matt, and you were like meeting money now, and I was like, ugh. I literally took pre-workout. I was shaking during the interview, like during the meeting. I was like, I was supposed to go to the gym. I was like, ah, okay. I was on the camera, like had the camera. I was like, oh, this is terrible. Matt's talking. I'm just like, okay. But I mean, you just like, like we talked about, you got to go after it. Like we need the money. You know what I mean? We, we, 
we know this is a thing. Uh, I mean, I know what I did. Put it like this: like I have like three or four sleepless nights here, wondering what I'm doing. Phil will tell you, like for like, what are we doing here? Like, are we chasing that thing that's not there, right? And day two of Airmen trying this thing, and I was like, yeah, we knew exactly what we were doing, and we should have did it. Like the feedback is out the wazoo, man. I put a guy in it, 124 on the flight line, and was like, takes the edge off, I can work. I had an airman actually tell his leadership that I can work just fine in a warehouse where the building had been, the AC had been shut off. The supervisor was like, hey, take a break, you're tired. He was like, no, I'm fine. I can keep working with this on. Like you hear that and you're like, okay, we got, we got it here. They knew it. Phil knew it. Matt knew it. Now we're just putting a little bit more meat to this thing and it's just a matter of pushing. But um, yeah, when I talk, it was a deadline. Like I'm not, like I literally, like I need to go to the gym and I was like, no, this ain't happening right now. We got to get money. Um, um, but yeah, as for what we're doing with it, I know that was the question floated. What are we doing next? So Matt literally just so sent out these six. Um, the first one that's been here, like I was talking about, the first one that's been here, I've put it on, like I said, I think it's been almost seven career fields, 15 different airmen, um, 15 different airmen, and uh, feedbacks through the roof. I mean, we're talking dirt boys. I brought on a, a group of dirt boys one day doing cement in 112. And all the dirt boys, one was like, this is freaking amazing. The other five were like, can I buy it right now? Um, is that a possibility? Uh, I put on the warehouse kid that I told you about working. His leadership ended up calling our cons and was like, can we just buy it right now? Um, I just put it on. A, <laughs> you guys will laugh about this. And I even told Matt or Phil about this one. This happened today. I gave it to a vehicle, maintain, a vehicle maintenance troop. Their hangar had went dead with AC. It was 100 and I think 15 in there. And the airman took it off because he was too cold. Real talk. That just happened. They walked in there like he took it off for like 30 minutes. He was too cold. It kept him too cold. And so knowing that this works, it makes it even better now to push this through. Um, so the intent will be is that one will keep moving around career fields. We'll move it to the Army. Me and Matt have talked about it. We want to get the army on board a lot more. I put on a first sergeant who was doing gate duty. He loved it. We're going to go more into the army with that one. The six of them will go on security forces members of the gate. We'll start collecting a little, a little bit more data. We know a lot. Like Matt will tell you, we know a lot of what's wrong. You know what I mean? We're just trying to get the field perspective uh, to, you know, add on to what's wrong. We want to, when, and I love this about Matt, like we want to give you something you're going to use, right? So give me all the bad. I'm, they don't hurt our feelings. It don't. It don't make us feel bad. Uh, give us all the bad, and we'll, we'll let. I. I say I will let them flush it out, and I will make sure that they get to test the new one. Right. So the six will go to security forces. We'll do some movement around with them testing. We might also take them out to like some field testing. What I mean by field testing is like just doing some PT, see how it helps, core temperatures, stuff like that, with some medical people. I have some medical people on board uh, to do that kind of stuff. And Matt cut me off. I'm not going to put any timelines, but I'll kind of just go over what we talked on yesterday. Um, we'll do these four or these six. We'll give them a list of things. Him and his team are already working on upgrades and stuff they want to do. Uh, we'll come back with probably four, maybe one, two different variants, whatever they decide based off the feedback in our discussion. Um, we'll take those four. Um, I'm hoping to get uh, Matt to come visit the UAE with Phil. Phil won't come. He's being lame. Uh, but Matt to come out here with these four. Uh, easier travel out here um, and uh, and bring those out here and let him see firsthand and get firsthand feedback from the airmen. Um, and from those four, he kind of talked about maybe sending two more of like upgrades or what he wants to change to flush out with his team. And then those two will kind of do for a, a final review for, you know, maybe what generation one purchasable um, GSA project is. And uh, Matt, am I wrong by that? Am I, did I go in the wrong direction? I want to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, you described the iterative process that we need to go through. So yeah, I want everybody to know the the bag he's holding and the pieces that he has, everything in there can can fail and it will fail uh, because it is commercial off the shelf parts put together in a certain way. It has weak points, uh, you know, and we can pick we can pick plumbing, we can pick power, we can pick uh, ergonomics, you can pick anything. We want the pad to be bigger. It's too thick. This is too bulky. It's there's too many tubes and wires. Okay, we got got it. It works and does it bring value to your job because engineering uh, solutions that address those issues is, is something uh, well within our capability suite. 
Um, what we need is that genuine feedback. We need the person that says, I need a waist strap because I'm on the ground rolling around left and right. I sit in a vehicle, but it's still a value to me, but it's four inches thick. I've got a back that's two and a half feet wide. I want a bigger pad. You know, uh, I want to, I want a chest pad. My job would allow me to wear a full vest. Can you make something like that? So all those things are, are valuable feedback and, and it's, it's, it's folks, it's, and this is, this is critical. You can get haters all day long. That's, that's not a problem. The goal is to get the people that are hating it the right way, meaning giving you feedback that you can address because I, uh, anyone you put on and everybody that says, oh, this is the greatest, it, it's no improvement. I, it, this is perfect. It's not. It's like, tell us what you hate so we can fix it because uh, engineers sitting in a room uh, with all the brain power in the world that have never been out uh, with their, their, their boots on the ground in that environment functioning in that space can't, can't even imagine you know, the improvements that need to happen. It has to come from the end user. And this thing was created by an airman, pushed forward and em embraced by the Air Force and patented. And, and it, all the innovations that are going to happen from this port are going to be end user driven. Okay. It's not going to be a technologist that figures it out. We may figure out how to implement it, but it's going to be them that define uh, the, the final form factor. And when, and what Ryan alluded to was uh, a design lock, the first generation device. We've iterated enough. We've addressed enough of the key critical pieces that 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 you can say this is what it's going to be, and then final final decisions can be made and things can be made uh, created, so it can be acquirable. Love it. So yeah, I we I eventually I want to get to the sustainment piece in the future, kind of the future outlook for acclimate and and where it's heading to but you, matt hit on another thing that we talked about was some of those lessons learned um with being good partners within the dod being good partners uh internally right if we have like these entrepreneurs who are creating and designing technologies or if we're collaborating and partnering with startups and, and other tech firms, venture capital firms, we have to be able to address some of that initial risk, right? And then be able to allocate resources, time, uh, anything that's within our sphere of control and influence to be able to get the feedback, right? Because that is so valuable, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of doors, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, Ryan, like, so many doors probably opened up from that feedback and it generated some of that, you know, some additional word of mouth, you know, where somebody looked at that and they thought it was great. And another person was like, heck yeah, I want that too. I want that for my people. Right. Like that's really where you, you generate that interest is from the feedback. Right. Great. So one thing I'll say, uh, as much as this is trialing the device it is also socializing it uh, to, to master certain powers point seven career fields have seen it even though this was originally intended for security forces it's like but it's applicable here but it's applicable here but we've also found where it's not applicable there are certain jobs that have constraints you know that that say oh you couldn't bring something with electronics into this space or whatever can we can we uh, envision a version of this that is that uh, that would still provide the relief but does not function with batteries or a control board or or so on and so forth you know, and again, continues to seed that. I, you know, we've got canines here. Is there any way I can put this on my canine? Because they they're melting as much as us, and they're wearing vests as well. You know, they're they're harnessed and whatnot. And it's like you know, the, and elements of that uh, have been embedded in in some of the Kentucky tasks that we created, which is expanding the capability of this. You know, smart feedback loops, um, applications that include you know, uh, whether it be animals or first responders or, or whatnot, you know, the, you, you could realize benefits. It doesn't solve every problem, but it is definitely something that has uh, more universal applications, but those are only realized through socialization, which, which is being championed right now. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to hit with that, Matt, and, and just the way my mind thinks, right, is we know defenders need this. So I go into a little bit of business mode here, right? Like we know defenders need this, right? But I will give you an example of ever, I've already started with kind of getting other people on board, right? The more career fields that need this. As I literally looked at the whole wing, I was at wing standup today. I literally looked at the whole wing. I said, when, you're, when in your career field, do you have a long period outside doing work? And I had calm. Think about that. Calm. Calm looked at me and said, we have cable dogs who lay cable two to three hours a day in the heat. 
my commander will buy them for us right now because I don't want them to suffer. And I didn't even think Calm was was a player here. Like you know, what I mean? I'm like Calm computers indoors. They don't need these. And it, they came out and they literally their their one of their superintendents emailed me was like, "Hey, were they been, we're laying cable on Thursday? Can we see it? Can we try it? Can we test it? You sure can. Let me know." And there are many career fields out there that I would never have thought like, "Hey, this is a thing." And they're like, "Yo, we get out here three four hours a day. Can we get it?" And I, and now I I'm pretty sure I can get almost any career field in this space who because we're hot we're hot. They understand they need help and they want to see it. So that's where I'm at right now is let's saturate this whole place with acclimate. My goal is I haven't got there yet. My goal is when we do wing stand up, I'm going to do the best I can for a squadron to say, Hey, thank you for acclimate. Help my people survive. Because if I do that, I know I'm on the right path because that brings us even more attention. Um, so that's really where I'm at right now. Like I said, the work, the work for me has just begun um, in how we're going to do this thing. So Yeah, that's awesome. I uh, just want to say thanks again, guys, for coming on here. Um, it's it's super exciting to see where you're at now, you know, uh, and I can definitely relate, Ryan, with the uh, Phil conversations to talk you off the ledge. Uh, there have been many a text and a messages offline to him to say, is this what it's like every day? Um, so I think that's just part of being in the innovation space and trying to get a good idea moved forward you know um it's a big force with a, like you said a lot of good ideas so how do you flesh that out to the appropriate people and get that buy-in um so with that being said and knowing knowing what you know now and the lessons learned that you've accumulated along the way pun intended uh what would your advice be to to an airman or a lieutenant or a civilian on the ground now that you know, in their heart of hearts, they have a good idea, something that, you know, is going to benefit the force and the people in it. What would your number one or two take away? What would you want them to know that maybe they weren't, they aren't ready for, or they're not, they haven't seen yet that, that you've seen in, in the journey uh, of this product? So, man, that's a, that's a, that's a question. Um, Airman to know. So one thing I think, I, I take it from my side now, being an innovator, being in charge of this innovation cell, right? And just to let airmen know is, okay, let me, let me, let me put this a good way. Um, people in the Air Force don't truly understand what innovation ecosystem is or cells. So the first thing I would say is just because someone in your chain of command, someone in your work section says, that's not doable, that's not feasible, don't believe it. Don't believe it. I would say that's my number one word of advice, right? And great example is, is what I took over. And I don't say this bad because the people I took over for, first of all, this thing is only 10 months old, right? Literally, I'm on month 11 of this place being around. And I said it very clearly when I took over, my goal was, and I thank Phil for this and Matt and Dora and everyone on this place. My goal was to change the perspective of this place. This place is not a four wall room with two 3D printers. This place is somewhere that opens up your, your world to a place where people can help you make your ideas become a reality, right? I tell commanders all the time, I never say no. We don't say no because literally right now, and Phil knows this, I can make a call right now that Phil, I have the greatest idea in the world. And Phil is gonna want, he's gonna want me to explain it to him. That's understandable. But Phil is then gonna go, I have this, 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 and this, right? And so I would say to young airmen, don't, don't listen to your, the people around you that are saying it's not possible. It's not a thing. We can't do that. Um, because literally, like, I'm not going to lie to you. I, when people come in, I'm like, this is how I start my conversations usually. If you had no rules, no regs, no commander, no one telling you nothing, and you wanted to fix this problem, give me what you got right now. And they start talking. And I'm like, you know we can do that. And they're like, Wait, no, we can do that too. But, but no, we can do that too. But how do we get this through? And I try to explain to them, like, if it's a legitimate thing and it works and it sees value in the Air Force, we will find a way. AFIs are only suggestions. You know, they're written in place. I know a lot of innovations came around. Phil's talking about, like, they've changed the AFIs based off of they're just literally suggestions written from probably when the Air Force started. You know what I mean? Like, so I think if I told an airman, that's basically what I would say is, listen, go to your innovation cells. If your innovation cells tell you no, um, we... 
we should probably talk about that. Whoever's in charge of that innovation cell. And then also if, if you're Aaron to tell you, no, don't even listen to that because I guarantee you, I've been in the security forces world and I, and Matt's been in the Marine Corps. And if you've been in the Marine Corps, man, some of us at security forces and, and, and Marine Corps guys, well, literally, I guarantee you 50 people told, told Captain O'Brien, that was the dumbest idea. Why would you waste your time with that? I, I will put money on that, that his peers said that at least five to 10 times, if not more. Um, because that's just the way people are, right? They, they, we've already done it this way. We can't go better. So I said it three times, don't think anything is impossible. Like that's really what it comes down to. And actually I had a chief, my new chief who took over the wing literally looked at the airmen on base. And this was a huge representation of innovation. And he said, we have an innovation cell. Don't tell me anything's not possible. He said, in your formations to your airmen, don't ever say anything is not possible until you step into that room and you give them an hour or two or three or weeks and you let them work their magic with the people they know and uh, and go after it. And then when they tell us nothing's possible, then then nothing's possible. Then it's not possible. So I think that's number one. Like I want to expand on that. And I, I got to watch because I'm, I'm again, we talked offline. I got to be careful. Right. So when I tell you people. People don't understand innovation, right? I'm not going to say titles. I had an individual call me, an innovation cell, say, we have an idea. I say, okay, like I said, we don't say no. They brought me out to the unit. I even told Philip this. He'll probably laugh. They brought me out to a unit. <laughs> and no joke, they looked at me and they said, hey, can you guys, can you guys make us a bigger table or buy us a table? And I looked in there and I said, can you explain to me the problem set? They said the table was too big for the room. And when I looked at the room and the table, the room was covered in crap that needed to be thrown away. It looked like a pretty much a pigsty and they wanted me to clean up their stuff. So, and I'll put it like this, leadership called me. It wasn't A1C, it wasn't a staff sergeant, it wasn't a master sergeant their leadership column. That was a leadership directive to use Phantom Works, to use innovation stuff for that. So the knowledge of what we are and understanding what we can do for them is lacking mightily in the Air Force. Yeah, innovation labs and spark cells around the Air Force and the DOD are not uh, 3D printing awards uh, outlets. It's not an outlet store. It's yeah. not it's not a, a, a fix, a, you know, an, an internal um, housekeeping problem yeah. or additional yeah. resources, right, that you can pull to go get people to to work in your unit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I literally I, no joke. I feel you. I that, you know, that chief, that chief is right on the money. And if that's that's the kind of that's the kind of mentality at those levels, I mean, they just have so much influence, right? They're chiefs, yeah. like there's no E10, you know what I mean? Like we we do need SELs and chiefs in the Air Force to really get behind it and tell that message to the airmen. Um, it hits different, right? Like it does when, when you have somebody that understands 45, 50 years old, been 25, 30 years in the Air Force and has seen seen it all right seen all all the things that we haven't seen uh, and they have the, their own experiences but have the wherewithal the rec you know that they can recognize that there is new things on the horizon new things coming down the pipe that they don't necessarily know about but that they know that their airmen can get after those things yeah i yeah, mean that's, that's one, huge yeah that's one thing like the one thing i'll say currently about my my current leadership in a great way is and i have it written on this board back here is it says sel safe ethical legal that's your boundaries. That's what they told me. They said, whatever you want to do, as long as it's safe, ethical, and legal, I bless you to go do that. And that's literally where it goes. And they, I've brought ideas that Phil's thrown at me. And literally, I think at some point, they think I'm either making this stuff up or I'm cheating. But I'm literally like, no, we're just networking through the ecosystem of people that are established out there. Um, because again, I think there is a, a lack of knowledge uh, in that thing in, in, in the Air Force, like, it, of what innovation should be. And even like, I have a reservist. I actually use the reservist as a, a, one of my guys is a reservist, and he's an outside perspective looking in. And he's looked at me numerous times. He's like, he's like, Sergeant Powers, we're in an innovation cell. Does the Air Force know that? Like, he's, he's like, and he's, he's in the reserves. This is like second deployment. He's like, do, do, 
do they understand what we're supposed to be here, sir? Because I don't understand why they just asked me to do that. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, God, come on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you can't say no, they because the requests are pretty crazy sometimes. Thank you, Philip Perry. You made, you made my day. Hey guys, I just want to highlight too in the thread earlier, um, Mr. Mahoney mentioned that he was part of the initial team that established the kind of allowed Mike to take the EOP program. And I, I want to extend gratitude to you too, sir, because I, I wasn't aware of the names behind the picture, but I know that that was a huge leap in, in pushing an airman's idea, airman's innovation to, to patenting, to, to branching off and, and formulating a way forward for for a collaborative effort between AFRL, small business, Tesseract, you name it, right? And without those kind of initiatives, um, that initial like momentum wouldn't have, have been felt through all the way to, to Master Sergeant Powers, right? It was everybody's like small momentum, small force to Matt's point, right? Like just giving a little bit of extra effort not the typical, hey, this is my day-to-day -day thing, so it hits my desk, and I'm going to say, no, I'll get to it later. It's like, hey, let's give it a little bit of momentum. Let's see what happens. And I think that's the the winning story behind this, is even at the end, with a little bit of, of money we managed to get from AFWorks to help support this, it, it still gave it enough momentum to get it off the ground. And that, that's all a lot of these things need. They don't always need 100%, just that little extra 10%. And I just wanted to highlight that and thank you, Ms. Roney, for, for helping champion that. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, and, and thank you to all of you that were a part of this because um, like I said in my, my post, it's, it's why we do what we do is to help enable people with great ideas to be able to take them forward and, and turn them into something. And um, yeah, it's success stories like this that, that, like I said, it makes all the bureaucracy that we fight worth it. So thank you. Also, That's Mr. Mahoney, one thing I like, go ahead, Brian. No, as I say, also one thing you posted in there, Mr. Mahoney, is just so you know, you were talking about innovation of buzzword. One thing my commander, he he literally, so our commander has been here a month, right? And in his immersion, he literally looked at or he looked at the group, the squadron commanders, and I was in the room, and he was like, "I want to stop. Don't ever tell me innovation is a buzzword ever again. Innovation is the Air Force. Like, stop." He literally was like, "I don't want to hear that this is a buzzword." It's not going away. It's who we are. We're an adaptable force. We're going to innovate through. If I hear buzzword one more time, there'll be an issue. <laughs> like that's pretty much where he is with innovation. Is stop saying it's a buzzword. But he's a good one. Hang on to him. Um, yeah, yeah. What what I meant by what I said was that um, I see it get used by a lot of people in leadership yeah. or even in the rank and file um, as a buzzword. Like they use the word, but I don't think they really understand what it means. Um, because yeah, people will say, I want your, you know, what they want is they want the problem solved. Um, uh, but then when you bring forward some crazy idea that's totally outside their comfort zone, they're like, well, anything but that. And it's like, that's not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard way in the innovation cell to like, when you brief success all day, like Barry, me and Phil have talked about this when you go up to like wing staff and everything like that, and you only tell your successes, you only tell your successes. And we've created this organization where you only talk about successes. And it's like, how am I supposed to get better if I'm not risking to fail? Like I actually had a project here with my, with some people in the office and they were like, if this fails, who's going to brief it? And I was like, I am. And they're like, well, it's going to give us a black eye. Bro, we're in an innovation cell. We're going to mess up a lot of things here, guys. Like we really are. Like we're trying things that are not made or created. If you think everything's going to be the golden goose, like we talked about offline that one time, it's not like there's only a few times you're going to come across an acclimate. You're going to come across a project kinetic cargo. You're going to come across these once in a lifetime or, you know, that are like, hey, this is a game changer in a, in, a, in a one spark cell. Right. We're going to mess up so much. And that's the one blessing that I've kind of think that is just my personality. that's kind of helped this place is like. I messed up. Sorry, sir. I didn't waste any money. Maybe I wasted a few dollars, nothing crazy in a prototype, or maybe I met, I apologize. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt by that or think that you got, if you think, if they think below me or they think I'm not good enough for the innovation. So I don't know, but that's just not who I am. So uh, that's been a little bit easier with this kind of stuff. We try everything. Probably sometimes our own fault. But. 
Yeah, there's a good yeah. quote. Um, it goes something like, I don't fail, I either win or I learn. Yeah. Facts. Amen. Amen. That's a huge, that's a huge thing. We talked about this. Like w- th- there is there is no failure in trying, right? I want to get rid of failure and just make it a, a the, it, it's a learning, it's a learning curve. It's a lesson learned and it's a way to make us better. Like innovation has never and will never be like a zero sum game where we're always winning. That isn't how it works. I mean, that's not how even the smartest, most powerful, influential people running venture capital firms with multi-billion dollar portfolios are not picking 100% winners. I mean, if anything, it's you're looking at 10 to 15% of them are the winners that generate the ROI to keep them to keep them going, right? If you've got so much failure baked into, into your plan, uh, we just need to get a little bit more comfortable with understanding how innovation truly works. So that's, that's great. And thank you, Sean, for that. Um, That, that is like, that's why Nate and I are here. And I'm so glad that we started this series to kind of like, you know, I I know we're getting close to to time and I want to give, I want to give anyone any parting shots or anything, but that again, just to reiterate, like, this is exactly why we started the series is to highlight the success stories um, and bring them to the forefront because it is a battle, you know, and we're walking around with black eyes all day, every day, um, but it's worth it. So I, I appreciate everything that, that all of you have done to make this a reality and to make acclimate what it is and what it will be uh, in the future for the for the airmen, for the warfighters that are going to be using it. So thank you very much. Um, Nate, if you have any any uh Anything, um, I'm going to open the floor up here in a minute for for closing comments and, you know, go from there. Yeah, I got uh, just to close that you already mentioned it, you know, um, I love our involvement here in this space that you and I have, Austin, um, this part of discussing innovation and discussing projects along the way and the different points of their successes and then the lessons learned. Um, I think that's an important avenue and so to see where this project is at and hear where it came from and to see where it's going to move forward here in the next you know six eight ten months uh that's pretty exciting so we'll definitely earmark where we're at and see where this thing goes and have you guys back uh and and see the journey from now until where it ends up because i think that's you know the next step in this story so with that we'll open it up if there's any questions in the field or any closing comments that you guys want to make. I just want to say thank you again. Uh, I know everybody's literally around the world here uh, jumping into this chat. Um, it's really exciting for us to be able to have these conversations. And uh, I just want to thank you for, for joining joining us today. I got one more. And unless anybody else has anything, I don't want to cut them off. Philip loves me because we could talk all day about this subject. Um, I think, so I would leave everyone with this. And I know this is a podcast that's going to go out to a bunch of people. Uh, like again, I'm at 45 days in this thing and I'll get a little like mushy, uh, mushy in this, but like, put it like this. I would have never got to this without Dora Hernandez, right? I would never got here without Philip Berry. But in those processes and talking to these people, it was literally taking risks the whole way. Like Phil had no clue I was. I think the conversation, first conversation me and Philip had, this, he was probably like, I don't know who you are, bro. You are the weirdest thing in the world. And I was like, yes, I am. Let's keep working. You know what I mean? Like, and he he pushed me in the direction, right? And then even like when he brought Acclimate and I went and took a risk to talk to Matt, Matt easily could have looked at me as a, as a vendor and said, bro, I don't, we don't talk to you. Like, give me money <laughs> and move me along. Like Matt could have did that. Like, I'm not saying you did that, Matt, but Matt could have did that. Like, but I took that risk there, right? Matt could have taken a risk in sending this product. He took a risk in sending this product out to me. And you know what I mean? And trusting me to make it champion through, you know what I mean? We're all taking risks from this. And the one thing I'll tell anybody in the innovation world right now, keep taking risks because none of this happens if I just don't keep pushing it. You know what I mean? And and this won't happen without me, Matt and Phil and Sean, everyone who started this process, keep taking that risk and keep pushing that. And we're going to continue to push that. And if you want to be a part of it, get in this environment and keep pushing it. I'm not saying status, beat the status quo, beat up the bosses, the old heads, all that stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, Get out there, keep pushing this risk, accelerate change or lose, 
Um, we talk about in the big financial way, I believe really where it comes down to is changing the way we think and accelerating that process to the A1C, to the one striper saying, you have an answer to these problems, you can fix them for us. So uh, I leave on that is like, just keep going in all of this, right? And you're going to fail and just get up one more day and keep going. Um, that's all I can say, man. This has been so much fun. My wife actually talked to me. She's like, I want you to come home, but I don't want you to come home because you are in a space that you are loving so much in right now. And I want you to stay in it. And um, so I would, I would like to say thank you to the publicly Matt and Phil and Dora and everyone on here. Like, yo, we would, we wouldn't be here talking on this if it wasn't for you guys. Um, it's funny. My name's on some kind of advertisement. Philip put me on and I'm like, thanks guy. But like, I'm just, I'm just a dude. Like Philip said, if you ever start sitting in this process thinking you're doing this stuff for you, I got a year and a half less acclimates for the next 20 years. You know what I mean? That's for, that's for the people. Like, let's leave that legacy there when we all retire. You know what I'm saying? So, um, if you ever get in this world and you're thinking you're trying to change it for yourself, you're probably in the wrong world because you may never see it. So thank you guys again for having me. That's, that's awesome. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming on Brian and Matt and everyone. Um, I, I wish that we would have done this sooner. I mean, like our objective was to, to highlight you, th that innovation with acclimate, like and it provide insight inspire i'm freaking inspired i'm inspired like i'm ready to go like, <laughs> like so i i'm so appreciative of, of your time um and and all the effort that you've put in you know i know it's not easy so i think the lno network um innovators in the field are really going to benefit from the insight that that you all gave today so thank you so much um for your time and uh we'll we'll, we'll try to catch up with you soon and, and get an update so thank you Awesome. Thank you guys. Thanks, everyone. Philip Berry's my hero. Don't edit that.